presentations. So, all right. All right, so UFI is extension. Lake County is actually right in the middle of the state. I don't think you get more centrally located than we are. Uh, and again, I'm the commercial horticulture agent, Brooke Moffis. We have with us co-hosting Family and Consumer Sciences Extension Agent Lori Johnson, and then we have our office associate, Wanda Rao. And then Juanita Popino, our um, multi-county fruit crops agent, is also on the call today. So she's listening and learning, and who knows, we may put her to work before long too. So we'll see, Juanita. All right, so let's go ahead and start about talking about how uh, growers grow herbs in the store. Oh, and a funny thing about herbs, do you say herbs or do you say herbs? Do you pronounce the H? So this was actually a moment where I was embarrassed because I would say herb and I would pronounce the H. And one of my bosses said, you're pronouncing it like the man's name. You're not pronouncing it correctly. So I was a little embarrassed. And so I looked it up. And the British actually pronounce the word herb with an H. So they say herb. And so if you, you know, pronounce it herb, that's the American way. So I was doing the British way, which I thought was very proper. So anyhow, <laughs> I will use those two uh, words interchangeably because now I'm paranoid about it since I've told all of you. So, but anyhow, when you're growing herbs, uh, the producers are growing herbs, they do it in hydroponic systems mostly in central Florida, although there may be some other in-ground systems that they use as well. So the picture on the left says uh, basil and an NFT system. NFT stands for nutrient film technique and what they have is these tubes and they have these holes in these tubes and they mix all of the fertilizer in with the water and they inject it into these tubes and it runs down the tubes and the plants are the roots are there to pick up the nutrients in the water. And then they are also grown in these, almost like a gutter type material. Actually, it is a gutter type material. And then they'll put these bags of perlite and they'll put chives in the bag and some of these really easy to grow and easy to re-harvest types of herb crops. And then you can also grow them organically in hydroponics as well. This is a soilless potting mix. And what they do here is they actually side dress and uh, right down the middle with an organic type fertilizer. So you can do organic forms of hydroponics and grow your herbs that way. So uh, these pictures are all from some greenhouses that are in the Live Oak Swanee area. And then this is how they grow them in the field. So this is actually the same grower, but he grows the chives and he grows basils and some of the more delicate plants that uh, may need a little more water in hydroponics. And then he grows things like mint and rosemary out in the field. So when you buy those little bags in the grocery store and you spend $4 on a bag, uh, you may be getting them from one of these North Florida growers. There are also some herb gardens down in South Florida. I'm sorry, some herb growers down in South Florida as well. These are just some more hydroponic systems. Here's hanging bags. This is where they actually took these black, it's like a woven plastic bag here and they cut slits in it. They fill the bag with soil and they cut slits and grow the herbs vertically that way, which I think is very clever. And again, here's some more vertigo systems. And then here's another hydroponic system as well where they're growing in a soilless potting mix. They have the pots and these big PVC pipes and they have the nutrients mixed into the water and then they feed the plants that way. And then here's a homeowner hydroponic system on the right. This is called the Vertigro system. And here they're using pearl perlite with a mix of vermiculite, which is the growing, growing media. And they have these two stacks here. And if you have a family of four and you're growing these herbs along with lettuces or other leafy greens, you will get bumper crops out of these systems as long as you grow them the right time of year. And you will have more than you will ever know what to do with. But Lori's going to help us with that today. And she's going to tell us how to grow some of these herbs. But this is a recirculating system, which I like a lot. Uh, you pour water in the bottom of this system. And then then you mix the fertilizer in with the water and it recirculates. So it's a very a water conserving system. This is what it looks like up close. So you have the perlite with a little bit of vermiculite mixed in. And then another product that we're using now and that I've worked with that works very well for growing a lot of your crops is coconut fiber. So that's another one. And then there's just a pump in the system that pumps it up the pipe in the center. But we're going to do a whole class on hydroponics. Some of you have been asking for it in our surveys. So thank you for your input so that we can give you the types of classes that you want to hear. So we'll go more into hydroponics another time. But now we're going to talk about 
more how to do it in your own garden. So what makes an herb an herb and not a spice? If you know, answer it in the chat box and I will tell you. But I wanna see if anybody knows and again, trying to make it as interactive as possible. So what makes an herb an herb and a spice a spice? Are we getting anything coming in the chat, Wanda? Mm, yeah, one person said herb, herb use the leaves and sticks are more seeds, right? Spice, yeah, absolutely. Spices are more seeds. Actually, your herbs are your leafy materials and your spices are the bark, the seeds, pretty much anything else. Um, but you only use them in small amounts and you use them to season, enrich, or improve the taste of certain foods. So you can grow herbs seasonally in Florida. Some of them are going to be perennials. And some of the things I love about them is you can grow them as part of landscape bed. I actually took this picture at Lake Sumter Landing in the villages and they could have picked sweet viburnum. They could have picked thryallis. They could have picked any kind of landscape plant, but instead they chose to grow rosemary. And you know, then if you're growing it in your landscape and you have a recipe that calls for rosemary, go out, take a few clippings and put it in your dish. But they can be grown in containers. You can grow them in landscape beds like you see here. You can also incorporate them into flower gardens. If you wanna grow herbs along with your vegetables, a really good uh, thing to do is only plant them along the edges of your vegetable garden or an area where, where you will not be tilling and disturbing the soil because many of the herbs that we're gonna talk about today are perennial, whereas your vegetables are annual. So you just don't wanna disturb the roots or disturb the roots as little as possible with your perennial type crops. And then Lori's gonna talk about some of the health benefits. Yes, good afternoon. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, in general, cooking with herbs uh, provides great health benefits um, and by using them um, to flavor your food, you're decreasing your sodium, fats, and added sugars. Um, I encourage you to try to incorporate herbs in the recipes that you're currently cooking with. See uh, how you can structure those recipes a little bit differently. And then those that you um, look for um, adding to your um, menu cycle. Um, it's important to um, take a look at um, Certain herbs can go better with different flavors, but really the combinations are endless. It really depends on your flavor palette and what you enjoy um, eating. Remember that for cooking times, um, such um, longer dishes, such as soups and stews, um, you wanna add those herbs a little bit later on because they tend to cook out of the flavor. Um, for things such as salads, slaws, and dips, you do wanna add those early on and give them a couple hours for those flavors to meld together to really get um, the most out of it. Also, one tip is to finely chop or mince your herbs with uh, kitchen shears. Um, that's gonna also help release the flavor. Um, and remember for every teaspoon of dried herbs, you use one tablespoon of fresh herbs. Um, and one other tip is when you double recipes, you may not need to double the herbs. Um, you just wanna make sure um, maybe you start with um, one and a half times first to see if that's a good flavor for you. Um, if not, you can always add more. Thanks, Lori. I'm actually taking notes. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's good information. I did not know that about the cooking the flavor out. So if you're not going to cook it, you put it in, uh, you can leave it as long as possible. Right, because the flavor. <laughs> Right, because some things just take several hours and you do want some, you know, some herbs in there, especially if you're cooking a turkey. I know I love to stuff a lot in there, but if you're cooking some other soups and stews, really, those are long term and you kind of lose the flavor along the way. So you can use some, but definitely save more of it for later on in the cooking time. Very good. I did not know that. All right, so site selection. If you've attended our vegetable classes, they're very similar to vegetables in the fact that they usually need about six hours of sunlight, uh, six to eight hours of sunlight is good. There are a few of the leafy herbs that will do fine in the shade and some of them will need a little shade in the summer months, but for the most part, they need sunlight really to produce. A heavy shaded spot is not gonna cut it. You can use, uh, well-drained soil is best. A lot of the herbs that we grow here in Central Florida are from the Mediterranean region of the world where they have al slightly alkaline soils. So this is different from a lot of plants that we, you know, 
know, try to grow in central Florida that like things slightly acidic. A lot of your herbs like it slightly alkaline and they can take it reasonably dry. I think quite honestly most of them are easier to grow than vegetables. So I call this herb gardening the gateway into vegetable gardening because once you start growing your own herbs then you start to you know dabble in the vegetables. And so I recommend starting an herb garden before you get into vegetable gardening because they're a little bit easier. So but again, super easy to grow. When to water, it all depends. It all depends on the type of herb that you're trying to grow. I'm just going to give you as a general rule here, you water when it's dry to the touch. And just like in container gardening classes, I tell folks to do the knuckle test, which is where you go down and you stick your finger in the pot and you go down second knuckle deep. And if it feels really dry, water if it water it. And if it feels the least bit moist, don't water it. So I know that sounds really, really simple, but we tend to overwater or underwater our plants. So it's a really good idea just to use the knuckle test and, you know, check for water. Um, but you know, mint likes considerable moisture, moisture here in Florida. Uh, I'm from the North Georgia, Southeast Tennessee area, and we had really clay soils. So mint thrived in that area. I find that it's harder to grow in Central Florida unless it gets an adequate amount of water. Your sage, your rosemary, and thyme, they prefer well-drained um, to maybe some lightly moist soils. So all right, and then some climate challenges that we have here in Central Florida is the heat and the humidity of the summertime. So some of the herbs that we're going to talk about grow best over the cool season, some do best over the warm season. But we do have some heat and humidity issues, especially with dill. It will start getting a fungus when we get too humid uh, or too hot. Basil, you have windows that you can grow basil in, so it can be one of the picky herbs. Uh, it, I'm talking about sweet basil here. So, you know, in the, you can grow it in the summertime, but if we start getting lots and lots of rain, it can sometimes get a bacterial issue. So the other time you can grow it is fall, but if we get a hard frost or freeze, it can kill it. So you have a window with basil. You can grow it, you know, uh, from probably once our rain, summer rains stop to the first freeze, or you can grow it after the freeze and up until maybe June time period. Uh, I have some in my yard, it's still going, so fingers crossed that it continues to grow. Another plant that can be prone to some of the uh, fungal and mildew problems that we get is sage. So that one, I think they just really like that leaf texture. It's kind of a soft, fuzzy texture. All right, so have fun with herb gardening. You can think about doing some different themed gardens. People like to eat herbs, but so do butterflies. So they will feed on dill and parsley and fennel. So just know that if you plant some of these plants, you're going to have caterpillars eating these plants at some point. So what I would say is just plant a whole lot of it so that you have lots for you and lots for the caterpillars too, because sometimes those caterpillars can defoliate a parsley plant overnight almost. Uh, so anyhow, so if you want to do like a themed butterfly garden, you could do echinacea and mint as an adult food source. You could even put in some of the um, milkweed plants as well. And then for a larval food source, those fennels and parsleys. And another bonus is a lot of our herbs have these umbrella shaped flowers where they have these large platforms of this large platform of clusters and your pollinators really like it. So if you have issues with pollination in your vegetable garden, it's a really good idea to plant some of these annual herb plants. So just some other fun things is consider doing a salsa garden. If you like to eat salsa, you could grow tomato, tomatillo, onion, but the herb that you want to grow, right, is cilantro for that and then pepper. And then you could even think of a sensory garden using herbs too. We have some Cuban oregano and, um, you know, that's really nice and soft to the touch. And we've got some other non-edible plants in there like this um, a red fountain grass here that just adds a nice look to the garden too. But just some more landscape ideas. Uh, consider planting things that like to spread in a container or an enclosed area like mint. I think this little teacup pot is just so stinking cute. Oops, hang on. So cute, I clicked off of it. But anyhow, here it is. And I took this picture, I believe, at one of the theme parks. And then this picture is a fountain that they drilled holes in for proper drainage, and they filled it full of potting soil, and they have mint growing on the bottom, uh, I believe some type of thyme in the top. And then they had all different types of herbs in the bottom section of the fountain. And just another herb that can be grown too, that's grown as a landscape plant is artemisia or wormwood. 
So that's another one that can be grown as a landscape plant. And here it is planted with some knockout roses in the background. So you can really get creative and add these into your landscape and make it really fun. So for propagation, they're very easy to propagate. And most of them can be cultivated just by buying the seed, sowing it very shallow in a soilless potting mix, and you know, watering it, not letting it get saturated, but keeping it moist. And it can be very easy to grow them by seed. I think cuttings are very easy to do as well. So uh, cuttings may even be easier, quite honestly. So I'm just gonna show you some pictures really quick of how you could make a proper cutting. You wanna take a piece of the stem, and this will work on most of your herbs, as long as you find a place where the node is. What the heck is a node? The node is, where a bud is located on the plant. You'll often find nodes where leaves emerge from the plant. Um, so typically where leaves emerge, you'll find that node. So anyhow, you wanna cut a piece of stem about three to four inches and you wanna remove the tip of the stem and remove any of the large leaves. And you don't wanna use the very, very tender parts of the stem. You wanna wear, yeah, use the area where it's a little bit of hardened off we call that uh, semi-hardwood. So that's the type of area that you wanna use to make cutting. You can just use a really, really sharp knife. And here it looks like they're propagating mint. So you can see what the cutting looks like. They've removed most of the large leaves here and they didn't use the tip. They used kind of this mid section, but they also didn't really use a real woody section either. So then what you can do is you can have your pot that you wanna grow this herb in, and you can just fill it with potting soil and lay this cutting directly on the pot. You can take one of those old hairpins that they used to use a lot uh, that are kind of U-shaped. It's almost like an open bobby pin, and you can use those to secure it to the soil because the big thing that you need to do is make sure that that cutting is um, secured to the soil. You're just going to lay this horizontally on top of the soil too. So what you can also do to encourage rooting is you can take a knife and you can scruff up this little area here where we call it, we call it the node. Uh, you can scruff up that node area before you place that down on the soil to encourage some rooting. So anyhow, that's one thing that you can do for cuttings. Oh, here's the uh, pins that I was talking about. It's not quite a bobby pin, but it is a hair pin used to keep things in place, um, but also used to keep your herbs in place too when you're trying to propagate them. Oh, here it is where they just have scruffed up the bottom of the um, stem here. So, and here's an area where there's a node, there's some branching going on. And so they've scruffed up that area to try to encourage some roots to produce. You'll have a lot of pro fun propagating these and they propagate very, very easily. Brooke, oh, here I have a question. Someone yes. says, I have a question on cilantro. What do you do when it bolts? when it bolts, it is time to pull it out. And we're gonna get into more specifics on the different crops too. Uh, bolting means that you, your plant is, um, it's, it's lived its life, it's too hot for it, and it starts to throw up seed heads and it'll start to throw up flowers and it will get too bitter. So get that cilantro out of there and wait until the next cool season to plant it, so. All right, you can also divide some of your grassy herbs, like this is lemongrass here, really nice. They use it a lot in Thai cooking. They use it to flavor, flavor soups. You actually don't eat it, but it's used to flavor things. So you can see they just took a sharp knife um, and they cut through this. You could probably get, if you wanted, 20 cuttings out of this one root ball. It's so root bound. But anyhow, you can divide just by taking that plant out of the pot and making sure that you have a shoot and a stem along with some roots when you're doing your propagating of these grassier type herbs. And you can do this with lemongrass, you can do it with chives, and you can also do it with flowering tarragon as well. So you actually want to, and people don't realize this, you want to remove a lot of the leafy material uh, because th that plant's going to lose a lot of water loss and its root system has been greatly impacted. So you want to actually take a lot of the leafy material off to encourage that plant to root. And then it will start to produce, produce some new leaves there. All right, so I just wanted to show you a couple herb gardens and then we're going to get into specific, well, I think Lori's going to talk about how to use them in recipes more, then we're going to get into specifics, and then Lori's going to share some recipes uh, peppered throughout the conversation. So what is pepper, by the way? I just said the word pepper. Pepper is actually a spice because you use a seed from that plant. So this is a garden 
that I planted years ago, you can see 2008, we planted this. And this, we made this garden out of concrete block and we filled it in with a soilless potting mix and we also mixed in some compost in there for some nutrition. And then we planted the herbs. So this was this garden in fall of 2008. And this is the first large one that I planted, large herb garden. This is at January of 09, and the reason why I have this picture here is to remind me to talk to you all about the importance of covering your plants when we are going to, uh, you know, get those cold snaps and cold temperatures. We actually got to 19 degrees, I believe, uh, this winter in Bushnell area in Sumter County. And believe it or not, they're a little bit further south than us, but they're just kind of a cold pocket where they can get hit with the frost and freezes. So what we did is we took fabric blankets and we took PVC pipe and we kind of made little tents uh, throughout the herb garden area just to try to pull them through. And then after this frost and freeze, uh, you know, this was completely green. Everything else in the landscape was fried, but I had to get this herb garden to pull through because we just planted it in the fall and we were doing some cooking demonstrations with it in January. So it must survive. This is the same herb garden just that next summer. So what did we see? We saw, we planted it uh, from some smaller, you know, plants, probably four inch pots, fall 2008, and this is it, summer 2009. Can you believe it? I mean, we have Okinawa spinach in here, we have pineapple sage, we have different types of rosemary, and we are actually doing a gardening camp with kids, and we actually did a Prester book booklet with them for that camp. So anyhow, um, this is something that we just recently installed in Discovery Gardens. These are our herb spirals. So you may have heard of these before. So there's not really any scientific research to support the use of herb spirals, but a lot of uh, people use them and some cultures have been using them for centuries. So here's the thought is that you plant your plants that like well-drained soil in the very, very top and you plant your plants that like things with considerable moisture towards the bottom. And the thought is just through gravity that the water trickles down and your well-drained stuff likes it in the top and your more moist stuff likes it in the bottom where there's gonna be more moisture that's held. Um, there's not really a lot of studies on this, but they still look really cool. And I think it looks like we're, you know, we're summoning the Aztec or the Mayan gods here with this interesting spiral shape, but no, we're just doing something that looks cool. And so you'll see, you know, mint in here, lemongrass, we have rosemary in the top. We do have just some pretty things scattered throughout there though too that I must mention are not edible. But just, you know, another creative way to do it. All right, um, we're gonna talk about um, how to handle herbs to make sure um, for food safety that you're keeping yourself safe. Um, number one important rule. So it's important to wash your herbs before cooking and storing. You first, you wanna rinse uh, small portions under um, cool water um, to gently remove the dirt, um, or you can use a salad spinner, but if you do, um, just use it slowly and use a paper towel to um, dry them off. Um, if you have larger amounts of herbs, you can use um, a clean sink, fill it up with cold water and um, uh, swish the herbs around so that you help remove the dirt. Um, or you can use a bowl, um, fill it with water, do the same thing, um, and then rinse out the water, replace it, and uh, repeat that process until all the dirt has been removed. For storing them, there are a few options. You can place them in a refrigerator in an open or partially open bag um, or container. You can put newly cut stems in a vase or a jar so they'll look great um, in your home, um, but just uh, cut the stems as you would flowers um, and put them in about two inches of water um, it is a good idea if you're going to cook with them to cover them with a plastic bag, leaving a little space for air to circulate. And also too, we are going to share this presentation with you. So we'll be sending you a PDF file um, so you don't have to write feverishly for all these tips. Amen. Okay, sure. Okay. It says um, cilantro is a cool season herb. Papalo is a cilantro substitute that loves heat. Oh, culantro? Yes. They're, they're -L -O. Oh, I didn't know that one. Okay, we're going to be getting to that. Yeah. yeah. We're going to be getting into more of the specifics. Okay. And how does cutting grow just by laying across the soil? You just have to make sure that you have good contact with the soil. 
Um, you can also stick your cuttings vertically though too by removing some of the lower leaves and just sticking a sprig directly into the soil. You just have to make sure the node, which is where the leaves connect and where the buds are, is in contact with the soil. Okay, and how do you apply rooting powder? Okay, so rooting powder. Yeah, I didn't talk about that. Uh, believe it or not, a lot of your herbs don't really need it, but if you want to kind of insure a, you know, a little more, you want a little more insurance, I guess, there that they're going to take, you can get a rooting powder, um, and you can get it at any retail garden center just about, and you just take a little bit of the rooting powder, and you tap it into a small cup, and then you dip your node, the area again where the buds are, where the leaves connect, you dip that in the rooting powder and then stick the cutting. So the one thing you don't want to do is take your bottle of rooting powder and stick your cuttings directly into that rooting powder because now you've contaminated it. So you just want to pour out a little bit amount and it takes a very, very tiny amount. The other thing you can do is take a Q-tip, um, put a little of that rooting powder in a cup, take a Q-tip and then touch it to where the nodes are going to be in contact with the soil and that can help encourage roots. Okay, and we'll get over to Lori and she's gonna talk about more ways that we can store it, store sure. herbs and harvest them. Um, so another way is that you can freeze them. Um, you, you still wanna wash, drain, and uh, pat them dry with a paper towel. You can wrap a few sprigs together um, in freezer wrap or in a freezer bag or you can use ice cube trays as um, seen in the photo. Um, so snip or finely chop those herbs um, and place them in the ice cube trays. You wanna cover them with water or even olive oil. Um, I chose to do them in water and um, you just wanna make sure you submerge the herbs. Um, as you can see, one of my leaves um, got out and it's sticking out at the top. You wanna to try to cover them as much as possible. Let them freeze over. And then if you need your ice cube trays, um, you can pop them out once they're frozen, put them in a freezer bag, um, and then just take them out um, one at a time or multiple at a time to add them to any soups or sauces, or you could just thaw them in a bowl and use them in different recipes as you need them. I think that's a very cool idea, Lori. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, just my two cents anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking then, more notes. There you go. And then on the next slide, um, I've given you um, one of the one of the re uh, several of the recipes that I found. It always calls for this herb blend, and when I've looked for it on the market, it's pretty expensive. So I tend to make my own herb blends um, because we do a lot of cooking, and so it's nice to have uh, herb blends already ready to go. Um, so I encourage you to um, put together some herb blends that you and your family enjoy so that you can use them on a variety of dishes. Um, these, you can see the herbs that are involved, but they're great in any kind of um, marinating recipes that you have or um, grilling meats. Um, but remember, herbs and herb blends can be interchangeable in a lot of different foods. It's really personal preference, um, but those are what it's suggested to um, use for this blend. You know, my husband makes his own blend, and we call it Uncle Clay's Greek Dry Rub. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, we yeah. have cinnamon and a little bit of, oh, you probably don't want to hear this. We have a little bit of sugar in it, but we also have uh, cumin in it and some other things, too. And it's nice. we keep saying we're going to market it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Creating uh, your own family blend will get people excited about cooking in the kitchen because it makes it special. So that's great. Yeah. Okay, so oregano is one of these, you know, we all always think of it for Italian seasoning. So some people even call it the pizza herb, um, but it is a perennial. I love to grow this in the landscape. There's actually a really bright chartreuse oregano uh, that can be grown in the landscape. So it looks very stunning, uh, but it can grow by seed or cutting, full sun, well-drained soil, and you just want to divide it probably every two or three years. And then when you divide it, you can, you know, uh, you're multiplying it. And so then you have more oregano in your garden. So some of these ways that Lori's talking on how to preserve this uh, can be very useful, but you can also just go out into your garden and clip them fresh and rinse them off how she talked about in the salad spinner and directly use them too. So, um, but you want to harvest the leaves uh, when the flower buds form. Uh, you don't have to harvest it if you don't want, but a lot of herbs can be cut repeatedly. So again, these this stays very low to the ground, so you could use it as a border. So if you have a big landscape bed, consider planting oregano as your border plant instead of some of these traditional landscape plants like liriope. You know, we use that one a lot in the landscape as a border. Consider oregano instead. Awesome. 
And yes, Brooke, as you mentioned, it is um, the Italian herb. It's mostly around tomato dishes. Um, that's really where you see oregano being used. It's great on pizza, pasta dishes, can be combined with some olive oil um, or used in Italian vinaigrettes. It's easy to make your own homemade salad dressing and vinegar vinaigrettes and also um, marinades for um, lamb, chicken, and beef dishes. Oh, and the cultivar that I was mentioning that was like this lime green is called aureum and it has golden yellow leaves or it could be aureum. Okay, basil. It comes in lots of different forms. There's sweet basil, cinnamon basil, lemon basil. You can get African blue basil, which is great for the bees and it can still be used for culinary uses. Another thing I like about African blue basil is it's a perennial. A lot of these basils to me are annuals and they're hard to grow more than one year, or more than one growing season. But African blue basil, I've pushed about three years and it's been, um, you know, a very productive grower in my garden. So uh, purple ruffles is another one that's used out in the landscapes too. Sometimes I use, see the big theme parks using it too. Now, basil will suffer from freeze damage. And actually if we get below 45 degrees, it may even suffer suffer. It has a lot of water in its leaves and when you have plants like basil and impatience and other plants like that that have a lot of water in their leaves, when we get cold temperatures they are usually damaged. So we have sweet basil. Um, it's a true annual and it is going to spread by seed so you can plant it by seed but you can also do cuttings with this as well you can grow this in full sun but it is one of those herbs that will take a little bit more shade you want to plant it in well-drained soil because it can be very prone to some bacterial infections uh, and then again you're going to plant this in a specific window so you're going to grow basil spring through or, i'm sorry you're going to grow it spring hopefully it will make it through the summer for you it may not don't fret that's typical and then grow it again in the fall so and the flowers really are great for attracting some of those pollinators too and carrying on our Italian uh, theme here um, it's great in Italian dishes and adds a uh, really great flavor to your tomato sauce oh I have to tell you, you guys something kind of fun. Oh, I don't know if this is fun or not. It's fun for me. <laughs> but uh, basil over in Greece is called Vasilikos. And I fortunately was able to go there. One of my master gardeners had a um, condo on the Aegean Sea. So poor me went there for my honeymoon. Um, but anyhow, when we got into the cabs, my husband and I, all of the cab drivers had basil in a small vase and like the vase was glued to the, the dashboard of their cab. And so that was the very first word I learned in Greek was basilikos. And the cab driver and I could not speak at all. We just told them the location we were going to. But I asked him about the plant. He knew enough of what I was saying and basilikos. So there is basil in Greek for you. And the reason why they have it all in their ca cabs is it is good luck in the Greek culture. Which brings me to Greek columnar basil. So this is another uh, basil that's really nice. It grows very straight and upright. I find that it is more hardy than the um, sweet basil. And this could be a perennial for you. So this could grow for two, three, four, five years even. So we had a lot of luck with Greek columnar basil. But you could go nuts. There are probably a hundred or so varieties of basil out there in the world. And it'd be kind of fun to do a taste test with all the different types of basils, Lori. So maybe when we open back up and can do some taste testing, that could be really fun. I like it. Yeah, mm -hmm. me too. So leaves are the prime part of the plant that you're going to eat. You can remove the uh, flowers so that you'll get more leaf production. And once the plants start to grow to go to seed, their uh, leaf production is going to decrease because producing a flower and producing a seed takes a whole lot of energy. So I like to just prune the flowers off constantly in my basil, but sometimes I leave some for the uh, bees too. The small stems are okay, but once you get to thicker stalks, they really should be discarded as the leaves can be bitter. And then as Lori mentioned, you add basil at the end of cooking for the best flavor. And another herb blend for you, um, since we've been talking a lot of Italian dishes, um, again, making uh, one in advance of not just using one um, over the other, but really putting a variety of flavors together can really um, give your uh, food a nice flavor and taste. And this spice blend is great in pasta, salads, soups, or even on some garlic toast. 
And then we have mint. So this is one that I have actually really struggled to grow here in Florida. And I cannot believe that because when I grew up in Appalachia, this stuff grew like crazy. And my mother planted it around her home in the clayey soils there. And we, it, that was 20 something years ago. And I believe she's still pulling it up from slats underneath her porch, or at least she was for several years. So in Florida, it's not quite so aggressive, I have found, unless you have it in just the perfect spot where it gets a lot of moisture. So I think this does need frequent waterings here in Central Florida. Let me know in the chat box if you've had a different experience. Uh, have you grown mint in Florida and it actually escaped on you or actually really, really spread? I want to know some of your little tips and tricks, if so. Uh, so anyhow, I still, though, because of its aggressive nature, I still think it's a good idea to grow in an enclosed area. So, but it can do sun and it can do a little bit of shade too. You can, you know, you take cuttings of it. There, again, are lots and lots of different varieties. So this could be another fun one that you could grow as a taste test. There's chocolate mint, there's a pineapple mint, and you really do get the hints of some of these flavors too. There's a lemon mint as well. So you can have a lot of fun with it. And then there's spearmint, which is a different species from peppermint and then there's orange mint okay anyway I can just go on and on so anyhow uh, I think it's a really fun plant to grow and I like to occasionally just take a leaf and pop it in my mouth to get a little breath freshener in there too okay Lori you wanted to mention something about mint I believe uh, yeah it's just great um, and if you're not a fan of plain water or as Brooke said if you just want a little refreshment um, it's great to add some to your water or maybe a pitcher of water or also in uh, your tea. And then rose geranium this one is a little unusual and sometimes people use this to like flavor sugar so they'll put it in a jar with some sugar after they've cleaned it and dried it and everything um, but it's got a really interesting um, fragrance to it too. So I like to grow it because it's very easy to grow here in Central Florida. It'll take well-drained soils, um, almost sandy soils even, and it will still produce. And I just love to walk around and just crush the leaves. So I like to do that in the herb garden. Even if sometimes I'm not eating them, I like to just go around and feel them and crush them and smell them. And it's just this nice sensory experience. So I don't think this one's really widely used in cooking, but it could be used more. And then there's thyme. This one I like to grow as a ground cover. It looks really neat if you can get it started like in between maybe a flagstone walk or maybe even along a border as a very low ground cover in your yard. I have found the tricky thing with this is the right amount of water. So it needs moist soil but well-drained soil. So it does not like saturated soils at all. But it can grow to be a perennial. And that one garden that I showed you where we had the flagstone, um, it grew for years in that garden and it really took over and did absolutely beautiful. So you can remove the blooms to get it to push out more vegetative growth if you want or if you can keep the blooms if you really really like it. But they like hot sunny locations but again good draining soil but they also won't take it bone dry either which is why I kind of think this one can sometimes be tough to grow. And thyme is great to flavor veggies, soups, um, chicken dinners, and really the possibilities are endless. Um, some ideas might be lemon and thyme on roasted chicken, or maybe you're uh, sauteing some zucchini. Thyme is a great addition to add in there. Or even on baked apples, um, you can add some thyme. Um, it also goes well in your chicken noodle soup. This baked apple thing sounds good. We got to talk about this, Lori. <laughs> Okay, and then here's a picture of it growing at one of the themed park theme parks. Uh, I love to go around to some of the local theme parks, and I mean we have that in the backyard, right? I can't believe we have all these this worldwide destination right in our backyard here in Central Florida. But anyhow, it's really fun to go to some of the festivals and see some of the different things they do. But this is French thyme growing in a pot, along with some mint and with some rosemary, and this really helps set the theme of the France Pavilion. This was actually at Epcot, so this helps set the theme there they have a fragrance uh, you know they have a little cafe out there and they have this little fragrance um, boutique that you can go to and buy perfume so I think using these herbs really helps set that theme and then another one is pineapple sage so this one is not used a lot but I think it could be used more I just don't see a lot of recipes with it um, but it's a plant that can take it 
very well drained. It is a member of the salvia family. It is edible, so that's one of the reasons we're talking about it here today. Uh, it gets these pretty red flowers and it likes well drained soil. It's pretty drought tolerant and it will take full sun. So I, it's very easy to propagate too. And actually, to be honest, most of these uh, herbs that I'm talking about today are all very easy to propagate with cuttings. You just have to pay attention to that node and make sure that it is touching the soil. So that's one of the big things with it. And it's great in tropical recipes, um, such as like a citrus grilled chicken, um, or maybe you want to infuse it in some of your tea and use a tea infuser or stir it into some salsa. So a lot of different ideas for you to try. I almost wonder too, if you could soak it in like one of those fruit infusers that you do with water. Yeah, you know? I think, I think um, it'll help bring out the flavor. And then, you know, I really like infusers because they give you that flavor, but then you don't have to pick anything out of your um your your um your drinks that you have if you, it's really small holes so i i recommend those right yeah i have one and i i really like using it too but i have not thought about pineapple sage till this moment and then there is the sage that we often think of that goes along with the traditional american turkey dinner right um i actually make a shake a uh, sage chicken salad that's really, really nice with some sage and thyme, but anyhow. Um, so this one is a perennial. Uh, I have trouble growing this long term sometimes just because if we get a really, really wet year, it can get some of those mildew type problems. But one of the tips that I've learned that has helped me grow it is to actually go through and thin it out. So what you may want to do is actually take like, um, oops, hang on just a second. Let me see if I can go back here. You want to take one of the stems and you can actually cut out sections of the plant so that you allow air to move through it. And you kind of want to do this random so it doesn't look weird, but you just want to take out some of the thick areas of the plant and just let allow the air to move through it. And again, herbs can take repeated cuttings. And so they've almost adapted to that. You know, man's been using them. We've been cutting them over and over and over again. And through the millennia, they've almost adapted to that. And it's almost like they just thrive on being cut constantly. So do not be afraid to harvest your herbs. I will find, I find that most of them flush back very, very quickly after you do a good solid harvest on them. Okay, so this you're going to do full sun too, and again, well-drained soils for your sage. And sage can be used to flavor many side dishes like this roasted sage broccoli, um, or you can use it in pasta sauces or um, on apples, um, maybe some baked apples or Parmesan sage pork chops. Um, so lots of different ideas and ways to use sage. Um, just remember if you're gonna roast any veggies to do them in a single layer on a baking sheet so that way you can really get the texture of the vegetable that you're looking for and um, they can brown up and crisp as you'd like um, and making sure you're tossing them with some olive oil um, but not too much so that it doesn't seep out onto the bottom of your oven um, and making sure you're tossing them in between um, during the cooking process just to rotate those around and really get the texture you're looking for. So if you don't do that layer and they're mounded up, they're gonna be kind of soggy, aren't they? Yeah, and some just get like mushy and you can't really um, get the texture. Some take a lot longer if the tray is too overcrowded. So I recommend using multiple trays um, just because um, it will, and similar sized pieces because otherwise it's difficult to keep the cooking time consistent. I have to tell everyone, I love having an office right next to Lori because she's got me making homemade yogurt now. I never thought I would do that in a million years, but I like that I'm not using all these little plastic things every week and I can make my own yogurt and not have all that added sugar and everything. So I'm always popping my head in like, Lori, how would I do this? Or how would I do that? And she always gives me some good tips. So anyhow, but we'll continue on. So this one is a tarragon. This is called Mexican mint marigold tarragon. That is a mouthful, right? Um, it is considered a Mexican tarragon. It is a perennial. This one's very nice as a landscape plant too. So I could see you growing this as maybe like a small shrub or a low growing it's not really a shrub but like a low growing plant that you want to add in mass so you can use you can make cuttings out of it it'll do well in the full sun um, and it will be a perennial in your landscape too so it will come back year after year so full sun well-drained soil 
very, very easy herb to grow. And uh, I enjoy putting tarragon in some of my chicken salad. You can tell I make a lot of chicken salad, lots of different variations of chicken salad too. And then lemongrass, we talked about this. What's kind of interesting is I have some friends that live over in the Davenport area and they had one lemongrass plant and it pops up all over their yard. So I almost wonder sometime if this could actually be an invasive plant or just a really aggressive plant. There's a huge difference between the two. But you know, and I've had grown lemongrass in my yard and never had one pop up and I'm just slightly north than her. So it could just be that there don't get the frost and freezes that we do up here to help kind of keep things in check. But anyway, I've grown lemongrass in my home landscape. It makes a really nice ornamental plant. Uh, you know, you can see this is just one pot. It's big. It's beautiful. Uh, you cut them down low and then you can take and cut the stems at the base and use them to flavor soups and that type of thing mostly soups so and you can also divide this very easy we could take that whole lemongrass out of that pot and cut it like i showed earlier to get lots of different plants so i enjoy doing some thai cooking and so this is really nice for making that tom yum gong soup if i am pronouncing that correctly so and then lemon basil. Uh, lemon basil, I have found, oh, I'm sorry, Laura, you said some, you were going to say something about the lemongrass. Um, yeah, I just have a couple ways to cook with it um, in addition to the ones that you provided. Um, so there's two main ways to cook with lemongrass and each determines on how you handle it. So if you infuse it in teas or broths or soups or braising liquids, you want to trim off those spiky tops and the bases and crush just the stalks with the side of your knife um, because they help that helps release the aromatic oils um, and then you can cut it into you know one or two inch pieces um, you may want to remove those before um, eating or eat around them because they may be a little too woody for you um, but you can also use them in marinades and stir fries salads um, and um, just trim the top off and the base uh, you really just want to use the bottom four inches of the stock um, it does hold up in cooking and the longer it's in your food the flavor will um, get stronger so if you don't want that strong of a flavor um, you want to add it on later later on in your cooking um, or if you really like that intense flavor um, you can add it early on and then lemon balm, I have found to be a little tough to grow here in Central Florida. I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong, but I'm doing something wrong because I can't get this one to grow. So we do have some growing in, dis uh, some growing in Discovery Gardens though. So anyhow, it likes full sun. It likes moist but well-drained soil. And that's about all I know on lemon balm. It also does a nice little uh, flower on it that attracts the pollinators too. And you can use lemon balm in place of lemon peel in your recipes or to flavor, again, soups, sauces, vinegars, seafood. Um, you can toss a few leaves into your salad or even in a bowl of mixed fruit. And you can make some great herb butter too. Oh, I could see that being good in fruit, a fruit salad. Oh, okay, parsley is an annual cool season herb. Um, it will reseed. It's very easy to grow from seed and know that the butterfly caterpillars are going to eat it too. And they, the uh, butterfly caterpillars that feed on parsley are black swallowtails for the most part. And parsley is more than just a garnish. It's great to add to your soups and your potato dishes. So in talking about parsley, um, if you go to the next slide for me, um, I have another herb blend for you. Um, it includes parsley and some others, and it's great on fish, salads, and with your veggies. So again, do a little experimenting. Try these out. Um, utilize the herbs that you have and see what blends you can come up with. In cilantro, we, ha we already had some questions about cilantro. This is definitely a cool season herb. You are going to start it probably October or plant it by a transplant in November and you can grow it throughout the cool season. When we start getting to even April time period, it will start to bolt, which is where it sends up its um, flower head. And at that point, it will be bitter. Now, it's really funny for those of you that know Julia Childs, who Julia Childs is, um, she hated the taste of cilantro so much that if she found it in her dish, 
dish, she would take it and throw it on the floor of the restaurant she was in. So that's how strongly Julia Childs felt about cilantro. So don't know where I heard that from, but <laughs> I thought it was interesting all the same. Um, but it, I enjoy the flavor of cilantro. And there's some people that just hate cilantro. They say it tastes like soap. And it's either because it's bolted or because there's something genetic there where your taste buds recognize that as actually a harmful um, compound and so it registers as soap with your taste buds so I actually looked this up and I thought it was very interesting so some people it's delicious some people it tastes like soap and then some people like Julia Childs absolutely hate it but it can be um, nice in a butterfly garden the seed heads when they do go up will attract pollinators or the flower heads I should say and the seed of cilantro is coriander so this plant is used as both an herb because of the leafy green material and a spice because of the seed and cilantro and culantro, which we're going to talk about next, um, are great for your southwestern dishes. So in your salsa, chili, or your guacamole would be a great idea. And then there's culantro. This one you use if a, if a recipe calls for cilantro and you don't have cilantro, you can use culantro, but you need a teeny tiny amount. I would say a third or maybe even less of the amount of cilantro you might put into something. I also, this is also a little serrated here, so you really have to chop the leaves off leaves up really fine, but culantro is considered the summer cilantro. So this one will grow when it's hot um, and very dry soil. So it's a really, really tough plant there and it stays very, very small. So it could look nice as a border or tucked inside a perennial garden or maybe even on the outer edge of a landscape bed. And then fennel is really nice too. Sometimes they can be an annual, but sometimes they can be a fennel. Uh, the Bronte fennel seems to be a uh, perennial and it actually gets this nice bronze color, which I think is really pretty and it can make a gorgeous landscape plant. I always have a hard time actually harvesting the fennel bulb, which is not a true bulb by the way, at the bottom because it's such a pretty landscape plant. It adds a lot of soft, fine texture, which is really, really nice, but it's a cool season herb sometimes you can get it to be a perennial in the landscape and you can use it for butterfly gardens the butterflies might eat it too there though and you can use it in landscaping as well and then laurel bay uh, laurel bay tree i have been shocked at how fast these little trees grow. I've grown them in two different gardens now and man I tell you what you plant one and the next year you have a decent sized small tree on your hands. Um, so anyhow but this is the bay leaf that they use to flavor soups and spaghetti sauces and those, ty those types of things. Just word to the wise if you're going to flavor your soups or uh, stews or whatnot with bay leaves make sure you always take them out before you eat. So um, just they can actually be a choking hazard in your um, soups. So if you do not do that. So I actually had a friend that had a really bad experience with that. So I'm a little more in tune to that than probably most. But anyway, it is going to be a small tree in your yard. It can be damaged by hard freezes. Um, so if we're going to, and actually killed by a hard freeze. So if we're going to get a freeze, a hard freeze mean that means that we're 28, 28 degrees for more than four hours. Um, you want to protect this plant. And it needs a moist, rich soil too. But I have had a lot of luck with Laurel Bay and they can get quite large. And then chives, there's different types of chives. There's a garlic chive and an onion chive. Um, they are perennial. The onion chive, the plant is actually round with a purple flower, at least the leaf material is round. The garlic is flat with a white flower and great to use to flavor things. They're a cool season plant. They can be a long-term plant for you and you will divide them if you uh, wanna keep them going and want to you know, propagate more, you can divide them every two or three years. And then this is how they're growing them in uh, one of the greenhouses in North Florida. So they actually, you can see the repeated harvest. It looks like they harvested, this is from the one harvest that they did and now they're doing another harvest and they're just growing them in these pots with this irrigation piped into it. Looks like oregano is right next to it too. And it uh, adds a great onion, uh, mild onion flavor to baked potatoes, salads, uh, salsas, rice dishes um, by using the chives. So lots of great uses for chives. 
And then rosemary, perennial, very, very tough plant. It can take very dry conditions and full sun, but it does need supplemental water at times, especially when we get really, really droughty. And it can get quite large on you too. There's a prostrate rosemary that grows across the ground. Then these, the, there's these taller uh, rosemaries as well. And one idea for using rosemary might be try stuffing the cavity of your baked or roasted chicken with some rosemary and lemongrass for a really great flavor. That does sound good. And then lavender. Lavender has been a fun cooking experiment for me. It is a perennial. You can grow it by cuttings. You can grow it in the full sun. It likes well-drained to almost dry soil. So this one is one of those Mediterranean herbs that really likes it dry. It can grow on rocky cliffs over in the Mediterranean. Um, and then we get into trouble with it if we're growing in a really thick organic soil and we get a lot of moisture during the summer months. But you can propagate this very easily. And we have it growing in Discovery Gardens. And to be honest, sometimes it will die out, um, but we always have more plants and we never lose all of our lavender. So we might lose a plant here or there, but we'll just replace it through propagation, you know, and we always have a nice little harvest of uh, lavender out there. And thanks to the lavender that we have here um, and Brooke's idea, I was able to make some lavender cookies. Um, so we, I've created a short video we're going to play for you. And this video is also available on our YouTube channel um, so that you can view it and get the recipe. Um, but um, as the office said, they were delicious. Yes, they were delicious. It's one of my family's go-to. I actually had some lavender cookies, shortbread lavender cookies at a French bakery in Mount Dora. And I tried to find a recipe on my own to make and my children and I make them every Christmas. So we'll show you the video. It's super, super quick. I have to say, it's not the healthiest recipe, <laughs> but it tastes really good. Everything in moderation. Yeah, there you go. What was funny is our boss said, ooh, these taste like they're really healthy, but they're really good. And we're like, well, they're not that healthy, but they're still, they're still very nice. And it's a nice way to get those herbs and, you know, just another way to get them into your diet. One tip I used here is after I used this food, I used a paper blender to kind of crumble it up as you see now into the dough. Um, and just make sure your hands are clean, obviously before you start cooking, but especially before you start um, putting together your dough. You may have to refrigerate for an hour. I found that was pretty um, a long length of time. So just keep an eye so that it works up and not too hard. Um, and then I actually took it out of the plastic but still kept um, the plastic wrap over it to make it a little bit easier to roll out and keep it into one piece. We love for each I like about this recipe is it is a um, let's see we don't want to see any other YouTube videos you never know what's gonna pop up so anyhow <laughs> uh, but one of the things I like about the lavender recipe is it's a very unexpected flavor so how are you guys doing out there you guys have been quiet are you still with us we're in the home stretch it uh, we are closing in on the hour right now and we just have a 
few more uh, things to discuss with you. And one is another one of my favorite recipes. But anyhow, um, garlic can be very hard to grow here in Central Florida. Elephant garlic is one of the easier garlics to grow, but you need more elephant garlic to get the garlic flavor. Um, but you're going to plant it fall and grow it through the winter time. And you could attempt to grow some of the garlics that you find in the stores, but you may struggle with it because they really have a hard time with Central Florida's heat and humidity. Uh, but one of my favorite recipes is, um, I told Lori about this recipe and I was like, all, all I remember is it's Molly Ringwald's Greek boyfriend's recipe. And we both started laughing because it sounds so bizarre. Um, but I found it at a parade magazine. So anyhow, and we actually found the original recipe, but my husband and I make this and we do a couple variations with it. Did you want to talk about it real quick, Lori? Um, just that, you know, it's really easy to make. Um, there's a lot of great uses for tzatziki sauce. Um, I love tzatziki. So when um, Brooke provided this, um, I, it's just a quick, easy way. I think I was done with it within 10 minutes and then just put it in the fridge for it to infuse. The thing you want to remember, because um, I'm notorious for th doing things uh, too late, too close to mealtime, is just look at your recipes ahead to make sure if it needs to sit and those flavors to melt together, um, you, you allow for that time. So that way you can enjoy it when you um, plan to. Um, but remember, Greek yogurt has about double the protein as regular yogurt. So it's a really nice, um, healthy way to use a sauce on your chicken, your burgers as a dip um, without feeling guilty about it. Um, so that way you can um, it, just enjoy it with a little added health benefit to it. And another tip with this recipe too is it's four cups of Greek yogurt, which is a lot. So we actually usually split this recipe in half because although we love it, um, you can only eat so much tzatziki sauce <laughs> in a week. So anyhow, and I did just not split it in half. So we had tzatziki for a while. <laughs> right, right. We love it on almost everything. I mean, we will dip pretzels in it. We'll eat it with um, meat, and you know, anyhow. We, we really enjoy this recipe. So I told her, oh, we've got to stick it in the presentation. So Lori's been very sweet to try some of these recipe suggestions of mine. And she's enjoyed them, I think. So Yes, absolutely. I, I appreciate all the new recipes as much as possible. I like to be a little food scientist. Um, so talking about being a food scientist, this is your chance. Um, it's easy to make your own herb vinaigrette. Um, Store-bought ones can have added sugars um, and and uh, sodiums and fats. You really want to control your own ingredients and make it fresh. It only takes a few minutes. Um, so this gives you a base recipe that you can add your own fresh herbs, whatever you have available or that you'd like to have. Um, adding some olive oil, red or white wine vinegar, um, garlic if you want, and some other options. And get yourself a good mason jar or a, another jar with a lid um, so that you can just put everything and mix it up and then just enjoy it on um, the food that you would like to vinaigrette on. Super easy and quick. And next, I'm just going to talk about um, how you can dry herbs. There's a couple different methods um, in case you're um, wanting to dry herbs because I gave you a lot of recipes and things with um, dried herbs and you may have fresh herbs and not sure how to convert that process. Um, so it can be done a variety of ways. A microwave is probably the quickest. You can wash them, place them between some paper towels, um, dry them on the lowest setting on your microwave for just a few minutes, um, or you can hang them to dry, um, gather them in small bunches. Again, too many will just not let the air flow through. So small bunches are important. Tie them with 100% um, cotton kitchen string and hang them in a dry ventilated area for 24 hours up to one week. Um, you're just gonna have to check it and just make sure um, it's completely dry. And then we have on the next Could slide. Could I ask you a question on this, Lori? Sure. So if I'm gonna dry them in the microwave, it says the lowest setting, would that be like, you know, uh, if 10% is my lowest setting, 10% sure. of the power? Yes, the power. Okay. Yeah, you definitely wanna focus on the power on your microwave. Um, every microwave is gonna be different. Um, we have a very powerful microwave, so even the lowest setting, if yours is a very powerful microwave, even the lowest setting, you might wanna cut the time in half just to make sure you don't overdo it. Um, just a lot of variation with microwaves. And I have a very wimpy microwave, so I may need to increase the time. <laughs> yeah, we need a new microwave, quite honestly. Okay. Um, you can also do it in the oven. Um, again, washing them, drying them, or lightly doing them in a salad spinner. Remove the leaves from the stems. Uh, place them on a baking sheet. Again, single layer. 
um, at a very low temperature, 100 degrees for a couple hours with the door open slightly. And you just want to remove the leaves before they're brown and then you can crumble them and put them in an airtight container. Um, or you can use a dehydrator on the next slide. Um, you can place them um, on a dehydrator lined um, tray um, and then also um, add the mesh dehydrator sheet and then top it with another dehydrator sheet and dehydrate um, about 95 degrees Fahrenheit or until the leaves are nice and crisp. Let them cool and then you can take the stems off and you're ready to go. And then these are our sources for the presentation. If you will all go to the chat box, let's let's take some questions. And we also have a link to a survey in the chat box. And it really helps us out tremendously if you will fill out that survey. So if you all will go to the chat box and Wanda, let us know if there's any questions. Maybe there's okay. something that we didn't address that you all would like to know. Maybe it's a, a recipe or a certain plant. And then right, before says, we go to the questions, the guys, the uh, survey is all the way at the top of the chat box. So you'll have to use your oh, um, you know mouse what? to scroll up to the top. I will actually take and copy it and put it towards the bottom for everybody. There you too. go. Yeah. Okay. If I if I can get to it. Okay. Question. Um, I live in South Florida. I've tried to grow lavender numerous times. No luck. Does it prefer cooler climates? Yes, I think that may be the issue for you because I think here in central Florida we're on the cusp and we can grow it and sometimes we can get it to grow three, four years. It will be a short lived perennial, but we do get it dying out in batches and I just think the heat and humidity just is too much for it probably in South Florida. So you can always buy it and enjoy it as, you know, kind of a long term cut flower. Sometimes some of these plants that I um, really want to have and I really want to grow but that just won't grow in the area, I might buy it and just enjoy it until it dies. <laughs> That's not a lot of encouragement, is it? But, you know, I think it's probably reality as far as lavender goes. What other questions do we have? Okay. What's the difference between curly and flat leaf parsley? Uh, they're just two different uh, varieties, really. So there's lots of different types of parsleys out there. Um, I personally tend to like the flat leaf parsley, but some people like the curly leaf parsley. So, um, you know, it's just a matter of taste preference. I think they both grow the same here. They are a cool season annual. So they're going to die out for you more than likely in the summertime, unless you just get lucky and conditions are just right. Um, and I believe the black swallowtail caterpillars will go to both of them, I think. So and I see soft neck or hard neck garlic grow here. And what's the difference between the two? I have to be honest, I don't know. That's you stumped me on that one. So hard neck or soft neck garlic. You know, the fact that I have no idea <laughs> <laughs> may mean that, that it would be hard to grow here. Uh, I see that Juanita's on here. Juanita, do you know if you're still with us? Um, she is a horticulturalist and also a member of our office too that wanted to sit in on today's presentation. Uh, I do know that I've always just heard that it's hard to grow garlic in Central Florida and that elephant garlic is the better one to grow. And I've had luck with elephant garlic here at our gardens. But I have to be honest, I don't know the difference. But I'll tell you what I'll do. We've got to send you guys... Um, some of this information, we'll send it to you through email when you registered. We'll also send you another link to the survey. So, you know, if you don't want to get on that chat box and scroll to the top, I, I wasn't able to repost it, by the way, Lori and Wanda. Um, and then I'll try to answer this question about the hard neck and soft neck garlic and if they will grow here. I actually don't know. That's a really good question. Also, has anyone been able to germinate tarragon seed? I've failed four different times. Mm. I usually grow it by cuttings. I have not tried it by seed. So there's a lot of, I have a lot of unknowns too, just because, you know, there's only certain things that I've tried and actually done. And, you know, I like to grow that one, like I said, by cutting. Oh, also, if you uh, would like, you could always take cuttings of some of our herbs out here in Discovery Gardens too. We just ask that you let someone know if you're going to take cuttings um, and then also, you know, let someone know at our front office and let us know that you're going to take cuttings and we just ask that you don't denude the plant and just take a few cuttings and leave plenty for other people to enjoy too. So if you're having trouble getting that tarragon to grow from seed, you're welcome to come down and take some cuttings of ours. 
it grows pretty easily from cuttings. Any other questions out there? Let's see. I it's saw one in there about, sorry, Wanda. I saw one in there about how to make my, your own pesto. Pesto is super easy. Um, if you can use a variety of ingredients, but the basic for pesto would be um, basil leaves um, and using some olive oil, um, some garlic cloves and some kind of nuts, either um, a pine nut or uh, almonds. I've used cashews. The important thing you wanna do is um, after you blend up your um, basil with uh, some garlic leaves, um, I'm sorry, some garlic that you would um, put a little in your nuts, you would put a little bit of olive oil in, but then slowly add it into your food processor so that you don't put too much olive oil. Um, I've also made some carrot top basil pesto, which is on our YouTube channel, which is a little bit different of a twist. Um, but there's lots of recipes out there for pesto. Um, it just depends on what else um, you want to put in there, but that's a base, basic recipe for pesto. And John has joined us and he says pecans work for pesto. I bet a lot of different types of nuts would work yeah. for pesto, huh? Absolutely. You yeah, really use what you have. That's what I do all the time. I alter the recipe to use the nut or um, the herb that I, or spice that I have. Yeah, the carrot top pesto is actually pretty darn good that Lori made. Another benefit to being close to her office. Um, so anyhow, um, there was another, oh, it looked like Lacoma raised his hand. His hand, yeah, I was going to say that. So could you type it in the chat, Lacoma? If, if you can at all. If not, shoot me an email at my email address on, well, you know my email. Lacoma knows my email. But for those of you that may not know us, um, you know, again, you've had a brief introduction here today, but here's my email address. And then there's Lori Johnson's email address as well. So... All right. Well, we are going to have us. Uh, oh, thank you for the compliment. We always like to hear compliments, right? <laughs> but we've got that survey, though, too, for you to chime in and tell us what you want to hear. We've got some new classes coming up. Um, and Lori may have to help me out. I don't. Oh, hang on a minute. I've got my list right here. Some some new classes coming up. We're going to be getting the next batch out there. We're going to be doing right tree, right place. We're doing a class on pollinators next week. Uh, Reggie Doherty, one of our master gardeners is doing that. And then um, we're going to do what's bugging you. I love to talk about bugs. So I got to get a bug talk in here somewhere. And then um, I believe Lori is going to, and Jamie are going to be talking about, um, a, we don't know exactly what we're going to call the talk yet, but I think it's going to be something like you can eat that. And it's going to be things that we typically waste in the garden and how we can turn those into useful recipes. I'm going to attend that one. So I'm not even going to participate. I'm, well, I am, I'm going to listen, but uh, I want Lori and Jamie to teach me some of that. So it sounds fun. So anyhow, be on the lookout for our email. Uh, do that survey for us. We'll send it in the email, but it, uh, it's also been posted multiple times. Thomas' question was, he says, soft neck garlic does, does well here. It's vermalized for two to three months. Vernalized. Does that mean chilled lacoma? I can't remember what that word means off the and someone says, can they use honey as a rooting powder? No, I would not recommend that. I don't see how honey would have any benefits because with rooting powder, you're actually um, applying a little bit of a plant hormone to tease it to, uh, you know, increase that rooting. So I think that that's probably a myth out there and, you know, not one. I don't see how that could even work, to be honest with you. So you can allow, you can allow Lacoma to talk. I just opened it up to make him unmuted. Oh. Lacoma, would you like to share some information with us? Lacoma actually has a botany degree and he's been a master gardener in two different states now. So he's a pretty sharp cookie he's over there. He's a lot of good things to say in that. Okay. Uh, soft neck garlic does well here if you vernalize it for two or three months. And uh, elephant garlic is really a shallot. It doesn't have the same health benefits that white garlic does, the regular garlic. And uh, I have grown one hardneck garlic here, and it was music, was the variety. And uh, I found that that one does well. And so uh, you can grow garlic. In fact, my garlic this year did better than my onions. Really? And so cool. it just Thanks it's the vernalization, refrigerating it for a couple of months. Because up north, they plant it, they plant the hardneck garlic in the fall it goes through a frozen winter and then sprouts in the spring. So, so do you just store it yeah. in like a paper bag in your fridge? Yeah. Okay. 
yeah, paper bag is important. You don't want to do plastic. It may trap too much moisture. So store it in a paper bag in your fridge and you should be able to grow it like Lacoma. So that's pretty cool. Thank you for sharing that and helping me out, Lacoma. <laughs> I appreciate it. All right, everyone. Well, we are going to end the session. Thank you for attending. It's always enjoyable and we're going to be coming to you with a whole new crop of classes. So thanks everyone. And I'm going to go ahead and stop the meeting. And we've got to stop the recording too.